what inspired you to join the military and your trajectory and what inspired you to become a leader or you know for minorities yeah they um i i actually the army was not really a choice for me um oh. growing up uh in in houston back in the early 90s got into a little bit of trouble uh there was a an incident that occurred that kind of um placed me in a position where um i was facing uh you know a prison term or prison sentence and the only thing that really i, I don't want to say saved me but gave me an opportunity was the fact that i had dropped out of high school and got my ged and was going to uh community college at the time i was a delayed entry to be a reservist and they were going to actually pay for my college so because of that uh i was able to not uh go to prison and went to the went to the army instead it's not easy real education values and what does that mean to you and what do you want people to when they see this what do you want them to feel or think about i really want people to know and understand that Welcome to episode 19 of Building Connections Dora Talk podcast. I'm your host Betty Gonzalez and today we had the privilege of conversing with a remarkable individual whose journey from the barrios to East and Houston to becoming a doctor of education exemplifies resilience, leadership and the transformative power of education. A retired chief one officer 3, combat veteran and a passionate advocate for continuous growth and empowerment of underrepresented communities, our guest today shares a wealth of experience from the military to academia, emphasizing the role of STEAM, AI, and leadership. Join us as we explore lessons in overcoming adversity, the impact of technology in leadership, and the importance of growth mindset. Let's dive into the inspiring conversation. Good morning, Dr. Abel, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Betty, and good morning. I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to be here with you today. No, no, no. I am so happy and I'm so thrilled because not only you are a veteran, you are an Army veteran, and you are a Chief One Officer through retired. And I want to hear about this. So could you just tell us, you know, give us a little background of uh, your backstory, of where you're from, uh, what inspired you to join the military and your trajectory and what inspired you to become a leader or you know for minorities yeah they um i i actually the army was not really a choice for me um oh. growing up uh in in houston um back in the early 90s got into a little bit of trouble uh there was a an incident that occurred that kind of um, placed me in a position where um i was facing uh you know a prison term or prison sentence and the only thing that really um i, I don't want to say saved me but gave me an opportunity was the fact that i had dropped out of high school and got my ged and was going to uh community college at the time um i was a delayed entry to be a reservist and they were going to actually pay for my college so because of that uh i was able to not uh go to prison and went to the went to the army instead uh they wanted me to do the eight year uh eight year tour so five years active duty and three on the IIR, irr irr um, inactive uh, reserve component so i you know i jumped at that opportunity and i left it's a funny <laughs> story because I, I actually went to court October 4th of 1994 and October 6th I was in boot camp. So no, a day no, and a half this later. Is, this is okay. So wait a minute. I did not know this. <laughs> this is that's why I like to <laughs> ask about the background. So so your story is literally like we have an army cadence, go to war or go to jail. Yeah, something like that, definitely. <laughs> go to war or think... go to jail or oh. <laughs> So yeah, my question definitely. is, my question is, how were you given that choice? Uh, like they gave the choice, either you do this or you go to serve. Like I didn't know they give, you know, people in the in youth that choice. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it was uh, so much of a choice. It was a blessing. Um, my mom, you know, rest in peace. Um, 
she actually advocated really hard for me not to, you know, go to jail at that time. So um, hired an attorney. Uh, you know, it was it was kind of strange because that day, I don't know, the and I don't even know if this is like literally something that they can do. The recruiter, uh, my my mom, uh, the uh, prosecutor, my attorney, they all kind of convened to the side and uh, decided my fate at that point, which is <laughs> which is ultimately a blessing, you know, and not um, it wasn't something that it wasn't an easy thing to do. Right. Uh, because when the judge actually provided that, you know, kind of, I'm not going to say dismissing the charges, but kind of put them to the side. Uh, I stood up in the courtroom and the judge gave me the business. Like really made me, you know, look really bad and, and um, you know, did all the things that I think either an individual is going to take that in and accept that and do you know, not do the right thing or take that in and, you know, execute that pivot and try to, you know, prove to everyone that that's not who you are, you know, what was going on at the time. So I, I count that as a blessing, you know, a blessing that I was given that opportunity. I uh, went to boot camp and spent, uh, you know, a little less than 25 years of, of service in the Army and really never looked back. I considered getting out after the first tour, but at that time, my uh, my oldest daughter, she was only um, maybe, I think she was two years old when I came up for re-enlistment and um, decided to re-enlist and never, never looked back. Wow, that's that's deep. This is this is pretty interesting. <laughs> I could see I could see how everything ties in. So could you tell us a little bit more like what was uh, uh, like the field that you worked in in the military and then from there how did you decide to go into because you're a doctor uh you know to 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 go into a doctorate in the field that you actually did yeah i appreciate that question so i was an electronic systems warrant officer when i first uh, enlisted i was um, a 29 CRI. i did uh, radio and comsec repair so you know kind of just you know, through that entire evolution, that was my field, and then um, became a warrant officer at right under 12 years of service. So I got 12 years of service enlisted, and a little more than 12 as a warrant officer. Um, you know, it's just a natural evolution to continue to to try to progress in life and continuously learn in that capacity, uh, and that that really kind of fueled my desire. Um, to, to continue my education. I want to kind of, you know, go back a little bit and talk to you about, you know, that transition as a warrant officer and me being stationed a lot, a lot, most of my career, the only two state set assignments I had was Fort Bragg, North Carolina and uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia. So now Fort Liberty in North Carolina and Fort Eisenhower here in Georgia. And, uh, you know, in 2011, um, I had an invitation and I assessed with uh, Tier 1 Delta at Fort Bragg or Fort Liberty. And, uh, you know, some of my mentors were like, hey, man, you can't continue doing this. You can't continue deploying and doing those type of jobs, you know, at the expense of your family, at the expense of your mental health. Because at that point, I had deployed consistently um, oh, 2008 to 2009 I was in Iraq and then 2010 and 11 I was in Afghanistan so I was like literally gone for the bulk of those three years um, deployed in an active war zone uh, so I was fortunate and blessed not to you know get that assignment with Delta and my branch manager sent me to teach <laughs> at uh, at the schoolhouse here at the Warrant Officer Basic and Advanced Course. And um, I came kicking and screaming. But in that, I found that passion. Wait a to minute, teach. you went to Fort Rocker? No, 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 I came to Fort Gordon. Oh, to Eisenhower, teach, to, to teach. teach like yeah. an AIT in yeah. the field. Yeah, 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 yeah. The base, I'm sorry, the Warrant Officer Basic and Advanced Courses, well, you know, you're a retired Army Warrant Officer. 
but here we have two we have two technical um, phases so one technical phase is at Fort Lee Virginia and I'm not sure what the new name of that camp is and then the second phase here um, at Fort Gordon we teach all electronic systems radio comsec avionics uh, IT networking. But you were teaching organic. the warrant officers there as an enlisted. No, I was teaching the warrant officers here as a warrant officer. I was at that time a, a W. Oh, so you already had transitioned to a warrant. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I was yeah, confused. I was still, yeah, yeah, I'm I was still thinking you were an enlisted. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about that. I'm, I my am so going sorry. Like 100 miles an hour. No, no I, go I, ahead. I <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So, and I'm sorry if I kind of got the you and the um the viewers confused with the timeline, but that was in in uh in 2012 i was actually assigned here and became a warrant officer instructor and found that passion for teaching right oh. it wasn't something that um it wasn't something that i really truly knew i had in me i knew that i was you know good at at providing and presenting information and building consensus with my teams um, and of course as a warrant officer advising the command right kind of providing that influence from the side on on how to, they need to execute on making decisions. But, you know, in that, I became an, a, a, a warrant officer instructor here. And it was funny because it was 2012 and I was at 18 years of service at that point. Wow. Uh, and, and a lot of people don't know this, but I tried to retire at 21 years in, 20, in 2015. And, uh, the senior warrants, the W-5s, you know, the uh, the the crew <laughs> did not let me retire. They oh, wow. literally, uh, yeah, told me, no, nah, that's not happening. Uh, you need to take a short tour assignment. The, 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 the able. It sounds really low. Your oh, value sorry. sounds really okay. low. Yeah, just make sure that that we can hear because we want to hear what you're what you're saying. So, OK, so 2015. So what? Why did you want to retire then? And then what happened that made you do five more years almost? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, wanted to retire. It's it's one of those things, right? Like, what do you what do you do? What do you really want to do? At that point in my life, all I knew was a sol to be a soldier. I never had a job prior to being a private E1 in the Army. I think maybe I, I worked uh, at a restaurant, like at a, as a bus boy for two weeks, but I was like, ah, I'm not doing this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so that so that's literally all I knew. That was my identity um, for the for that you know 21 years, and I, I felt you know pretty accomplished at that point, um, and, and thought that at that time it'd probably be a good time to transition out into the civilian sector while I'm still young enough to you know take on a second career and you know move forward in something else. Uh, that didn't happen. I ended up serving an additional three, uh, let me see, I retired in January 2019. So yeah, almost four years uh, additional uh, in service. And uh, yeah, you had asked me about pursuing the doctorate. That's something that I promised my mom before she passed away that I would finish because, you know, that story, when I dropped out of high school and got my GED, she was not happy about that. So I felt always that I had disappointed her in that. So, you know, when she got sick, I left here and went home back to Houston to, to be with her when she was stage four. And, um, you know, in that time and those conversations and me taking care of her and, and doing those things, I had got accepted into the program. Um, and I ended up kind of pushing it off and not starting till later that year. But before she passed away, we had a conversation and I promised her that I would finish. So that's that's why I finished the doctorate uh, oh, wow. in education. No, that that's really nice. I'm pretty sure she's shining from 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 above and yeah. she's Thank proud you. of you right now. But I'm pretty sure she was proud of you before that though. Yeah, I I, I definitely know know that she was, but it was just something that I, you know, made a commitment and a promise and uh it's not easy. It wasn't an easy, you know, it took me almost five years to complete uh, the coursework, the research and to the, the writing and then to defend it. So it was a, a could, labor uh, so of could love. You, could you elaborate a little bit about what is the whole, how does the whole process looks like? 
Yeah, so there, there's a lot of people that have a doctoral level education. You know, they sit the coursework. The coursework is only one component um, of, you know, earning your doctorate or that title. You have to actually complete um, your own research and provide that research to add content to the body of knowledge within your career field. So, you know, what you're presenting is all your own. Uh, and in the in that dissertation, it, it took me a little bit longer because it was in the middle of COVID. It was a qualitative case study on Hispanic students here in the state of Georgia. Um, and they were not in school. So it was very difficult for me to, you know, gain active participation. And there's a lot of steps that go into that process. It's five chapters and it's writing, revising, uh, conducting the case study, doing the, uh, executing the data and the findings, creating the results, and then writing about your results. And then informing, you know, policy and leadership on how to, you know, um, execute some of the recommendations or changes that you want to see in your field based off of your research. So. Uh, four, four and a half years. It was a labor of love. Some people can get it done quicker. Some people do. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> but I was a, a, a father and a grandfather and uh, and wow. working full time. And, and, you know, when I started, I was still in the army as I was still active duty. So I was doing all oh, that okay. night, nights and weekends, you know. No, I mean, that's that's yeah. a, I mean, think about it. But but th but I believe the people that retire like yourself. Uh, from the military have it, a different level of commitment to see things through because uh, not only are we less than I, I just said this last week we're less than the one percent of the population that just enlist in any branch of service but for those that but that little percentage that actually enlist it's even if very few percentage that actually got through the finish line which you did and then once you decided that and you were committed that you were going to do that you did it it doesn't matter how long it took what matters is that you did it <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's, no that's it, it. that's good and and yeah, uh, you know and i want to talk about because like i said i didn't know all these details about you i didn't know i didn't know of you i remember seeing you because we have friends in common we're not mm -hmm. in the same field and i remember uh we have the same friend javi which I would like yeah. to know, like, how do you, uh, how do you know him? Because he is in my field. We went to yeah. AIT together. We had the same, the same background. We were, I mean, and Javi, he's such a great, I mean, he's a really good one officer. And in our field, oh yeah, he, he was just a master. Everybody just went to him. But not only that, he, he had the knowledge, but he had the patience and the, the humility to teach That's what it. he has. You know, yeah, this is definitely. this is something that I just really admire from him. I met his wife, his mother, and his twin girls. Oh yeah. Uh, like no, we like we like that deep. Like he just and his wife, she's she's lovely. They were just really nice people. So how do you how do you know him from? Because yeah. you're not the I mean you said one officer, but not the same field. Yes. Yeah. No. Definitely. Um, we were stationed together at Fort Bragg and Third Special Forces Group. Oh, yeah. He got he came there as a W-1, a young W-1. Um, and uh, I was there already at that point. I was at maybe 15 years of service, 16 years of service. And, you know, we just hit it off. We had a really tight friend group, you know, Javi, Brenda, the twins. The twins are the same age as my son, little Brian. Uh, and I, and I, go by Brian, you know, most of, at home with all my friends, you know, Javi, everybody. And, you know, I know you say Dr. Abel Salazar here. That's more like that professional thing. Uh, but, you know, you can call me Brian as well, because that's what I go by all the time. Uh, but yeah, we we grew up to well, not grew up together. We kind of like grew together when we were at Third Special Forces Group because we were in that environment deploying coming back we were in afghanistan you know back and forth doing our jobs um we actually took a family trip like all of our homeboys all of us and the families we took a cruise to the bahamas oh, wow. <laughs> so, okay. the, so you can imagine like it was all of us the, and the families so all the kids grandkids everybody I, no not grandkids at the time none of us had grandkids but kids um friends it was a big group and i, I I used to have that picture 
um, more readily available, but we were all there. And one, and you know, on the cruises, they do the captain's mess. Well, you know, we, we showed up in our dress blues, all of us that day, you know, and, and literally like hours before we were, you know, knocking them back, <laughs> knocking them back on the, on the pool deck. But, you know, that's just, we're just really tight. And I appreciate his friendship. I mean, I just talked to him a couple months back, reached out to him because one of the engineers that I was working with was uh, heading to the Dominican Republic and was, was leaving out of Florida. I talked to Javi and Javi's like, yeah, man, have him leave his car here at the house, man. I'll take care of it for him. So that way he wouldn't have to pay. So he's know, right, to, he, he's right here in Florida. He's right here in yeah. the uh, yeah. central Florida. Yeah, he's yeah. him and the family are there. So, oh, my yeah. God, I'm going to reach out yeah, to him. We, yeah, that's <laughs> how we know each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, so I remember. So when he, because I was in Korea that time and mm -hmm. he was reaching out. So I see you in Korea, Betty. Um, I'm going to go over there and I'm trying to go eat lunch with all of my, my besties. And I, he yeah. invited me and that's when you were there. I think I had that. Yeah. I think I have a picture, but man, uh -huh. I had to dig deep. <laughs> when I look yeah. right and I'm going to show it out here. That would be pretty yeah. cool to, to, if I can yeah. find it. <laughs> Oh yeah, definitely. No, no yeah, this, he, this is he's really a great guy. Yeah, that's great. So, so Dr. Abel, could you tell us about now? You, you are, uh, you have your own business because I know that you work for the the government, as you've mentioned to me, and I saw in your bio. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but what made you decide to to open your business in in the leadership field, and especially with the concentration in minority? Could could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah again you know life throws you a curveball and you got to figure out you know how to maneuver through it so another opportunity to kind of prove my resilient spirit it, it wasn't um it was definitely a choice i had already had the llc for a couple of years i just had it on the shelf um i was w out there working in industry and from my bio you can see that uh you know i worked with the defense contractors, system integrators, big fortune 200 company, and a small woman owned business. I actually was, you know, part of a layoff from there last year, um, at the end of the year in November, which, you know, it, that's like a, a, a gut check, right? To ha know that you're doing great things and trying to make things happen for an organization for from one day to the next, be saying like, hey, man, you know, uh, sucks to be you, but you got you to gotta do something else. We're moving on, moving in a different direction. So at that point, it was like right before the holidays, right before Thanksgiving. And I'm trying to figure out, OK, what what is the next move for me? What is the next uh, what is that next stage in my life look like? And at that point, I, I came to a realization. I actually went through a coaching class with Dr. Kristen Guillory. Well, shout out to Dr. G because she provided me some insight in, in mentorship that I never had from someone at that level. And what she instilled in me at that point was, you need to know your value because you're doing all of these things for other people and other organizations when you can be doing it for yourself and, and, and fulfilling your vision and your mission here in life. And that that literally was it it's like okay you know what let me let me take this llc off the shelf dust it off and take everything that i i've learned you know from the military i would say even before that you know growing up in the barrio where i grew up in the military and all of the 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 post um army retirement jobs that i had and just you know translate that into providing that um, experience and expertise for others and doing it, doing it for myself and, and building my own legacy um, for myself and my family. That's literally how it happened. So so what's the name of, of your business? Continuous Rev, Real Education Values. So you say an acronym. It's an acronym, yeah. Real, Real. Real Education Values. Values, real education values. And what does that mean to you? And what do you want people to when they see this, what do you want them to feel or think about? I, I, I really want people to know and understand that education is the greatest equalizer. And if you have, if you're rooted in real education values, you will continuously learn and grow and not just saying it 
because it's a, an acronym or a buzzword, but really believing it that when you have that, you know, baseline of that education, that's something that no one can ever take from you. I can be laid off from a thousand jobs. You know, my company can do well or not do well, but that that's the one thing that no one can ever take from me is my education um, and my experience. And I think that's important. So when they see that, it's really about being able to share my story uh, because I offer, you know, keynote speaking uh, opportunities as well as the leadership training and coaching, but also for others to understand that their stories are valid. And that's why when you reached out about the, the podcast, I was like, yeah, I would love to do this because it is about sharing our stories, the entrepreneurial, you know, spirit and and the things that kind of reside within um, our culture. And, and, and the American culture at large, right? The big melting pot is the entre entrepreneurial spirit. Like, how can we, you know, do our best to get ahead? So I just want people to know and understand that um, education is, to me, the greatest equalizer, regardless of positionality, regardless of race, gender, um, you know, sexual orientation, any of these other things that people kind of try to put labels on. Yeah, they can't take your education from you. Well, well, that's deep. But I just, I'm, I'm just here thinking as you're speaking mm -hmm. about uh -huh. real education values, right? real education values. Yeah. You talking about education from a person that is a high school dropout <laughs> yeah. to a person that became a doctor, right? Why has this resonated with you so deeply now? But before you didn't have that much, you didn't put value in this before. So yeah. what has changed and why does, well, why is this important to you now? Yeah, I, representation, 100% representation. Growing up, you know, I didn't see a lot of, of male educators where I grew up. Um, a lot of male Hispanic educators where I grew up and even less male Hispanic doctors and educators where I grew up. So for me, it's really about, you know, being that role model and, and you know, creating an environment where, you know, when somebody looks at me, they don't automatically assume, oh yeah, that's Dr. Salazar right there. You know, they're looking like, oh, look, look, look at this guy, bald head, you know, lined out beard, tattoos, whatever. They were like, do oh. you have tattoos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where like, do you who <laughs> yeah. They'll be like, Who's, who is this guy? But to be able to present that in a way and say, hey, you know what? I did it. I grew up the same way you did. And we are not our situation or our circumstances. And sometimes it takes, you know, someone to see some themselves in someone to come up out of those situations and circumstances. So that's why I'm passionate about it uh, and about the education piece, because you know, what better story to tell to be like, hey, man, I was a high school dropout, GED to EDD <laughs> and all that in between. Yeah, you. You, know, you you can do it, too. And and you can be on your own pathway and your own trajectory. Just know that it can be done because, you know, just like those that came before us, you know, did certain things to establish where we are in society. You know, it, it, it takes, you know, all of us to do that and provide that uh, role modeling and those mental models for those, you know, students and 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 people in our communities. And I, when I say students, I don't just mean children. You know, I mean, you know, adult learners. You know, we have to see each other. We have to be represented. And you know, if not me, then who? I'm just gonna do my part, whatever that looks like. So, so those are able. I hear you. You said you want to be um, that role model. You want to have a representation. You want someone else that think that they can to look at you and and get encouragement to to do, go ahead and do it too. But why is this important to you? Why why representation uh, is important to you? Yeah, man, that's a that's a. 
I, I'd probably have to like sit and marinate on that one for a while. There's a lot in there um, on, on why representation is important. I, I just feel that we need it. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a story if that's it. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. So, yeah. Perfect. So, so do you know do you know uh, that a lot of I don't know if you ever heard of this. People say no, no, no. In the movies, uh, we need representation. We need people that look like us. We need uh, yeah. somebody on the table, you know, that feel like us, so that they can have the voice. But even though I understood this, um, like intellectually, mm-hmm. it never resonated to me emotionally. And, yeah. and, and it is crazy, but I'm gonna tell yeah. you when it did. This is okay. So I'm from the Dominican Republic. I don't know if I mentioned. Uh-huh. And we have this uh, costumbre, right? This tradition that we uh, yeah. say la bendición, mami. Basically, you're asking for the blessings. Yeah. And we ask it for everybody, for your grandparent, your mother, your your uncle, everybody. Bendición tía, bendición tía, bendición mami, bendición papi, bendición abuela. And I I taught that to my kids, my my son and daughter. And they do that. My husband grew up like this too. Yeah. So they used to say, bueno, Mani, buenos días, what else? Se bendición, mami, que Dios te bendiga, right? Mm-hmm. So, but they don't hear their friends doing this. They only hear this in our house, right? Yeah. Until we went to see Spider-Man, the cartoon. I don't know if you've uh-huh. seen that, the yeah, second yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. The second one, the cartoon? Miles Morales, yeah, yeah, of yeah. course, yeah. So we went yeah. to the cartoons. And uh, we as, as a family, my son is next to me. My daughter is next to my son. I think my husband was next to me. I don't know. We were like this. I just uh-huh. remember when the kid was telling, Bendición, mami. I said, Dios te bendiga, mi My son, I lit up. Like, we're not the only ones that say this. Look, they're saying this too. And he just looked at me. And I was like, I told you, you're supposed to say this. And it felt so real to me. And yeah. it's, it's an, a, it was a great example of representation. Yeah. Wow. You know that. Yeah. That connection. That's the. Uh, you know that connecting piece for you. And I understand the. You know, the heartfelt connection on why that mattered so much because. It, it is was part of your son. heritage. Yeah. So yeah, what, yeah, what, yeah. what I what I think is like, like I always knew that it's good, but I never felt it. Like I actually. Mm-hmm felt it like it was emotionally for me and for my kids at that time because my son yeah. and daughter look at each other and they both looked at me and I was like yeah this is what we do yeah, <laughs> and cool. I mean you if when you watch it again you'll remember because if you I were to, if you if you were raised like this you'd be like oh yeah this is us and when I saw the movie oh my god this is really recent the movie Blue Beetle have you seen that oh yeah oh yeah definitely and I think they were more of a Mexican background uh-huh. And yeah. I just loved it. And I was like, wow, I love the movie from the beginning to the end. And yeah. I was like, man, <laughs> this is resonating with me more and more, you know, more and more. And I totally get it. Maybe we don't know how to put it in words. That's what I'm trying to say. Maybe yeah. you don't know why this is important to you. You just know it is, you know? Yeah. And this is an emotional connection. That. Yeah, this is an emotional connection that sometimes we just feel drawn to. And and I do believe it is important because like I, I'm telling you, yeah, last week I was just talking to another veteran. She was from the Navy. And she represents mm-hmm. military transitioning, military females transitioning uh, out of the military. That's, that's what she does. And, and like you, it's also for minorities, for everybody. Just, yours is inclusive to all minorities. Yeah. Uh, you're representing to, to leadership. For her, it was military, yeah. uh, female, mil- military females transitioning. And she's talking about inclusion. So I was I was uh, telling her the story about when I was in the field artillery and I was the only one in when we were deployed. A lot of the stuff they just didn't understand. Not because they didn't like me or they didn't want me there. They just didn't know. You don't know what you don't know. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes you just have to be there to be represented for people to know for something as simple as the bathroom. Yeah. Because it was I was the only one really and they were just they didn't have a female bathroom and yeah. and then when they finally had one they wanted to take it and I was like dude no you have all of these other bathroom I can I can you I don't want to wait for you to go to the bathroom because you have like 20 yeah. toilets no that one is mine <laughs> so just little <laughs> things like that that you need to otherwise you wouldn't think about right yeah yeah no that you know that's 
you talk a little bit about you know inclusion i i am definitely of the mindset that you know that we can diversify ourselves away from inclusion you know it's it's great to acknowledge our differences but i feel like it's better that we um acknowledge our strengths and unity and collective and be inclusive and not you know wait find ways to kind of bridge those gaps rather than you know celebrating uh i don't want to say celebrating diversity is not a good thing because it is a great thing but i don't when i look at it as an inclusion professional i look at it more from the lens of i don't want to diversify away from inclusion i want everybody sitting at that table you know like like growing up back in the day um you know you 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 go to your grandparents house or everybody comes over everybody's sitting around that table everybody's together you know what i'm right, saying right, that's right. that's that's the way i i and i guess i don't know if that is maybe that is a cultural thing that that's how we i don't want to say show love but that's kind of how we just operate that we want to feel that inclusivity we want to feel included think, and not so much separated as yeah. as a human race no oh yeah definitely like, Think about it. When people bond and when they're eating together, you know, yeah. when you go into adversity, like when you go through basic training, you bond. It doesn't yeah. matter. It doesn't matter how you look like, where you're from. It doesn't matter. You just like we're going through this together, man. I, I hear yeah. you. I feel you. It just yeah. once you're there, it doesn't matter. It just it's just humans, you know. I just yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I don't know. So, but but you know, what, Dr. F, I will keep you here forever. Let me see. Let me go through this because I have a lot of questions <laughs> that I want to ask you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let me see. Diversity and leadership. How do you handle conversations about diversity in your teams? Like, for example, I don't know, because we are from the military background, but what if you go to, like you were talking about the universities or something like that? And like, how does, how do you uh, go about these conversations? Yeah, yeah. Like I was saying before, you know, I try not to focus on the differences. I focus on, you know, what unites us. And that's with everything. When you look at it, you know, as a leader, an organization is living and breathing like an organism. And at the heart of every organization is people. So we really have to just understand that if we focus on people, we can leverage the team's collective uh, intelligence and value, not that, just that is, you know, so not just beautiful. the individual. Yeah, yeah. and. Thank you. I appreciate that. And that's some, some of the things that I that I teach, in, you know, in the leadership training, building resilient teams. Um, those concepts and ideas, they're not they're not new. Right. The leadership, um, you know, strategies or, you know, characteristics, nothing's really new under the sun. It's just how it's kind of packaged in a way that aligns to the human condition it's, it's human nature to want to do those things and and live in and 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 be in a team or collective capacity that's that's the human society so you know i don't really focus on the differences i try to focus on what unites us what what brings us together like you said right that common mission that common vision um and leading through those adversities it does take the individual to have that understanding, that self-awareness, but that individual influences the team or the collective and that team and collective ultimately impacts the community as a whole. So yeah, I, that's the way that I approach that. So Dr. Abel, if, so let's say there's somebody listening right now or you know watching this podcast, would like to know like, what could they expect from your program? Like, what do they expect? Like, is it like a, a month long program, weeks? Is it like uh, days? What should they expect if they want to contact you? Um, let's say that they need this kind of, um, I don't know, training for their yeah. business. I appreciate that. So the uh, Resilience Building Leader Program, that leadership training can go one on one or in a group or cohort. Um, it's a seven week program and it's, you know, it results in a leadership certification. So it's not just going through leader training for the sake of leadership training. Uh, we go through the seven weeks um, with the core competencies in the seven week program. 
uh, if it's one on one, it's uh, one hour a week for seven weeks with me one on one uh, going through the competencies. Um, there's a lot of self reflection. There's uh, homework assigned. There's there's reading. It's just like a seven week course at a college or university. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm one of uh, very few authorized training partners uh, that is aligned to the credentialing body, our BLP, Resilience Building Leader Program. There are a lot of education partners, colleges and universities that are conducting the same level of training. So um, that's a that's a big deal to me, right? As an educator, to align myself to something that brings value at that level of higher education. So seven week program, um, we do have offer the opportunity to do workshops that can kind of tailor it down. Um, but it does uh, result in a leadership certification and there's three levels of certification. They can contact me if you want to, you know, put my I link will. to the website. Of yeah, course, they course. can contact me and, and, and we can uh, go through discovery and find out, you know, what needs the individual or if it's a leader that has people that want, he, want, he or she wants them to sit through this type of training. Just, you know, uh, identify the need and um, help them, you know, build out and we can collaborate on, you know, getting them through their leadership journey. It's a very good program. And then I offer coaching as well, one on one and uh, uh, DNI, the inclusion piece. Um, is it, for is it safe to say that your course is almost like train that trainer or is it just so you train maybe yeah. the leader for them to train their, their that, teams that, that, or just to implement? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. That is that is the highest level certification for the senior leader. Um, the RBLPT trainer actually is for the senior leader in an organization. There is a mid mid level or mid manager level that uh, is a coaching certification RBLPC, and then an RBLP, which is that entry level supervisor or emerging leader in an organization. So you have the ability to tear it out. Uh, but yeah, the senior leader, once they are RBLPT, are trained through all the competencies and are able to leverage those skills and those competencies for their organizations and their teams. And yeah, able to able, teach who will well. benefit for, from a certification like this? Like what organization wow. will benefit? You know, all, all industry, all organizations. And I, and I don't say that to be funny, right? It's literally, and coming from the military, we know, right? The leader and the lead. We understand that dynamic. The military organization is one of very few that train their future leaders from day one, right? We knew that as leaders in the military that we were training our replacements every time we PCS and went to a new organization. It wasn't about us. It was about the unit, the organization, the mission, the national strategy. So, you know, we have that understanding. On the flip side of that, we have some, you know, ways where we can't translate that and articulate that as well when we're talking to, you know, civilians in civilian industry. And that's why I say this training can, can you know, fulfill the needs across every industry because all of these concepts and content transcend industry. Uh, it's it's all the soft skills. And um, if you go to the website, there's information there that actually provides what the competency domains are. And uh, it's it's really good. It literally. I'm not I'm not saying this to be, you know, funny or anything, but I wouldn't have aligned myself with a leadership credential that I did not believe in and that I didn't believe brought real education value to an individual leader or an organization. I, I wouldn't have done it. No, I can tell you mean it because yeah. your face lit up. As soon as I ask you a question that you want <laughs> yeah. to talk about it, you're just like, oh, yeah, I'm so happy. I can't wait to tell you. <laughs> yeah, so this, definitely. Is, this is when you know you mean it. This is not just you. And, and and like I said, we are in a position, you and I or anyone that retires, to do something very meaningful that you, we actually want to do. And this is what I feel speaking with you, that, that this is true to you because otherwise nobody's making you do this. You're not you're not in a society where now you have to prove something to anyone else other than what for yourself. Yeah. So, but that's that's Definitely. that's how I feel anyway, because yeah, when we in high school, our parents expect us to graduate, they expect us to be uh, you know, 
good to society to to mm-hmm. grow up to do something productive and and not be you know the black sheep whatever however <laughs> yeah. you've done that you you grew up you did something for yourself for your family and now you're doing something for yourself and for the greater goods it's not something that's expected of you this is something expected of yourself this is how yeah. i see it this is how i see it for me uh what i'm doing right now like i wake up every day i wake up every day to do this i wake up every day to I put makeup up because I need to go work with a customer. I need to go do something like I don't. This is expected of me from me. Yeah. Right. No one is telling me you need to do this. <laughs> so this is what yeah. I see from you. So this is very general for, for anybody listening or, or watching us right now. Listen, if this is something that you need in your organizations, trust me when I tell you, I know a good one when I see it. Dr. Abel would be the person uh, that you would need. Uh, because he's doing it from a passion and he's coming from a place of contribution so let me ask you a few more questions before i let you go because i know you're a very busy man so (laughs) thank you (laughs) so what are some of the other ones okay Mm. Mm. okay this is a very good one that i probably want to ask for myself what changes do you hope to see in the education to help minority students wow oh man does it have to be deep Yeah. yeah i it's, yeah. Even though this is deep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, removal of barriers. Barriers, you know. And when I say that, some people will automatically jump and make assumptions that it's social barriers, environmental barriers. But I I would like to see those self-imposed barriers removed. What do you mean by from that? My, my, like just the uh, the understanding that they being here in this country is an opportunity you know growing up in this country is an opportunity and some of the some of the situations environments that that you know uh, uh, underrepresented minorities are in and they literally see that as their world that they are confined to that box and they impose those barriers on themselves because they don't see role models, positive role models that that have kind of shown them a pathway out of there. And a lot of times those self-imposed barriers, they're just like uh, those glass ceilings that people used to talk about in the 90s. You know, nobody's putting it putting it on you like me dropping out of high school that I, I did that to myself. Like I wasn't failing. Okay. You oh, know, she wasn't I was go- I, Yeah. No. They, yeah. <laughs> You're like, exactly. One day you just, I'm not gonna go. Yeah. One day just decided like, no, this ain't for me. Like, and that's. And I, and I know, think in that's hindsight, a, that's ridiculous. But you know, I think that's, that's a challenge, hindsight. though. I, yeah. That's a challenge because you said it's not. It's not an, an environment. It's not. It's not society. But how can one know that it's that they're not in the environment that they're in. They are in that environment. Now, think about it. I'm assuming you were probably 17 at during that time, 16, 17, 18, not sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is really hard. I think you had I think you had to start with us, like you say. Like mm-hmm. right now, this is what I believe the mentality of our parents. Uh they mean well. They come to this country. And I believe as a Hispanic, out of the group of different cultures that comes to the United States, we're the one that progressed this fast, the slowest, not the fastest, mm-hmm. even though we're the majority of the minorities here, in my opinion, I don't know, it might be more, it might be the Chinese, yeah. I'm not sure, Asian. Yeah. But for Hispanics, the reason I believe this happens, in my opinion, and I've never done any study, I have, I'm not a doctor, okay? I'm just, <laughs> this is from me. <laughs> no, but you, no, but you're accurate, you're accurate, actually, but by 2040. What I yeah. believe is, because our mentality is we need to be hard workers, not smart workers. Hard workers is like you need to work hard and they and they work for each dollar that they earn, that they earn. And I believe you need to learn how to make more dollars with less time. I'd be more entrepreneurial and not put those. The barriers that I see is that, for example, when what, this is what I saw coming up, growing up. The barriers is the the barrier of a scarcity. They yes, always yes. show us that the that progress is on the other side. Progress is for the next door a neighbor or for the across uh, for for someone else. It's never for us. Progress is never for us. 
but they don't say it like that, but the words that they use say it. Uh, and let me say, so, ¿tú crees que somos ricos? ¿Tú crees que nosotros podemos comprar eso? Do you think we can do that? you think we can afford that? Do you think you can do like such and such? So that already put it a limitation of the glass ceiling that you talked about that yeah. that's not for me. I cannot aspire to do more because that's not what we do. And I think this is kind of like my my motivation to do something more than just what it is expected for me to get done. Because I need to be that change. I need to be that example, as you're saying. In my families, uh, maybe if I say it, it's not the same as if I do it. And then yeah. if my kids see me doing it, maybe their kids will do something else. And then that's yeah. the way that I believe we can show our little piece. It's not going to be a lot, but it's something, you know, it starts somewhere. Yeah. And and I really appreciate this talk with you today because it was it's really refreshing that I align with you, not only because we came from the same background in the military, being a one officer, just the fact that we were in the military, but also that we were one officer. I've always, I'm always of the opinion that we were not, we were not the norm. We were, we were the outliers. We were okay. the one that saw the, a little bit more and a little deeper. And, and for some of these people that do not understand, because not only the one officer is rare in the military, in the branches of the we are, they're also rare in, in even within the branches, not all the branches have one officers. So for those of the people that don't know what the one officer are, uh, can you tell us a little bit what the difference between a one officer and a general officer? Yeah, uh, one officer is a technical officer that is has depth in subject matter expertise within their field. So uh, uh, we call them RLOs, regular line officer or flag officer. They're more generalists. They, they um, operate more in terms of uh, you say leading in, in 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 one aspect but more managing right they manage yeah so this is how i right? say it this yeah. is how, when people yeah. ask me this yeah. is how i can say it no i know it's kind of hard yeah. that's why i was like let me see someone else who yeah. say it different yeah. so what i say is the the you know captains lieutenants yeah majors colonels what people come to understand an, an officer other than one mm -hmm. officers I see them as they're wide, you know, they're wide. Yeah, they yeah. know a lot about, a, a little bit about a lot of stuff. But you can put them in yeah. the room, they understand what you're saying. They might not be in but, depth, but they understand. They're, they're but they need chief. Yes. Yeah, but they need but a chief one to explain officer, it. But they have, they, have, they have a one officer for each of those, right? Yeah. But a one officer is more that we go yeah. deep into just one thing, you know, one subject, one field. Uh, yeah. So, so yes. Why? And, and, and no, um, Betty, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. And we operate in a gray area because we've had the privilege of growing through the ranks and evolving and developing those skills and expertise over time. So we were enlisted, warranted it at W1 uh, by the Secretary of the Army and then commissioned by the president at CW2. So we've kind of hit every gate. and the 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 piece that i was really really an advocate for uh when i was teaching young warrant officers like hey you have to get your civilian education and i would tell them i'd say you know when you're in a in a room with a young lieutenant or captain they at least have a four-year degree mm -hmm. when you're advising a major or a lieutenant colonel they all have graduate degrees so you can be an expert that's deep right you can be a, a depth of expertise when you add and complement that with education and experience and expertise, then everything you say and everything that you provide as far as um, advice and counsel, it holds weight and levity because you've done all the things you needed to do to be present at that table. Not that you have to prove anything to anyone. But just so that way, when you show up there, resonate. they know. Yeah. yeah. You sh when you <laughs> showed up, you showed up like, chief, chief, <laughs> yeah. chief, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Get yeah. to in the room. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. it's taking me back. It's taking me back. Yeah. Okay, yes, so, and to, to seal it off, right? <laughs>
uh, what is your uh, next big goal for making a positive community impact? So, no, I think you've already said it. You said it all. I really, really love yeah. everything you said. Um, Thank you. How can people uh, connect with you? Like, do you have any socials or how can they connect with you? Yeah, I have to build a social presence. You know, my <laughs> whole military career, I, I held a top secret clearance. So it was one of those things that I kind of steered away from. LinkedIn profile page. Um, I know you have that. You can post that uh, in the comment section or what, whatever you're going to do when we post this. So my LinkedIn, Able B, uh, Able B Salazar on LinkedIn. And then my website for Continuous Rev is leadingtogether.org, leadingtogether.org. And just reach out. You know, I, I look forward to having conversations uh, in, a, in a remote world where we are so connected via electronics and IT and this media, um, I feel disconnected. So I really appreciate the opportunity to, you know, have a, a, a 3D conversation. So if you want to connect with me, connect with me so we can get on a discovery call and, and see how we can collaborate and, and uh, you know, work together to accomplish your goals. That's, oh, that's no, no, all this, I have, Betty. I appreciate great. it. Well, guys, you heard it from, from Dr. Abel. Uh, I'm going to link all of this information in the description below. So if you want to connect, just reach out to him or you can reach out to me and I can connect you with him. Dr. Abel, thank you for taking the time. I know you're very busy. Uh, I really you, enjoyed this conversation. It was really enlightening and refreshing. Uh, I hope to have you again back in the show. Maybe you, you give us examples of some of the people that probably you helped throughout this conversation. And take care, guys. Until next week, thank you for talk, talking, uh, building connections with our talks. Talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Real quick, calling all the professionals, entrepreneurs, and community influencers. Are you ready to showcase your business, share your knowledge and experience with our engaged audience? Building Connections Doral Talks invites you to become a guest speaker on our podcast. Share your unique perspectives and inspiring stories with our listeners. We believe in the power of your voice in shaping that conversations right here in Doral. Click the link below to submit your information and be part of our next episode. Join us in building connections, sharing knowledge, and growing together. Don't miss this opportunity to be a future guest on Building Connections Doral Talks. Tune in, connect, share, and grow together with Building Connections Doral Talks, reshaping the way we engage with the diverse voices of Doral, one guest at a time. Doral Talks, your voice, our community. Click the link now on the show notes, the screen, or in the comments below, or just scan the QR code to submit your information as a guest. I hope to see you soon. See you in the next podcast. Bye.